Hello everyone and welcome back to Items of the Week. I'm Lori Williamson uh, in the Collections Department of the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, thanks for being here and I am joined again by my wonderful colleagues, Sandra. Hey, I'm the 3D Objects Curator, Sandra Ryerson. Yay, we're glad to see you as always. And Jennifer Hubscher. Hi, I'm the Curator of Photography and Moving Images. Thanks for having me back this week. Yeah, well, we're glad to. Um, we're, we have Jen back with us this week because we're going to talk largely about photographs again. Last week we focused on dogs and cats. We wanted to talk about pets because they, so many have been adopted in this pandemic and we're so grateful for that. This week we're talking about other animal photos in the collection, especially ones that are a little offbeat or strange. We're starting with this one with a little boy, his pet cat, and his pet squirrel. And I have to say, when I saw this photograph the first time, I thought that was a rat because I couldn't see a bushy tail. It does look kind of rat-like. It's a baby squirrel, which I wonder, why don't I see more baby squirrels out in nature? They had to start somewhere small, right? But I, maybe they stay in the nest until they're big enough. I don't know. But I never see baby squirrels, which really weirds me out. What, what, I thought all rodents were born naked, like hairless. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. They are. And baby squirrels do not have bushy tails. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know that you use uh, Moonlighted as a squirrelologist. <laughs> <laughs> Squirrels were apparently often pets in the end of the 19th and early 20th century, which really weirds me out. But uh, this one is actually pretty cute. I was looking at the cat. What more can you tell us about this photo, Jen? This photograph is actually made from one of the negatives in our Minneapolis and Star Tribune collection. We also have the accompanying negatives for the Pioneer Press around that same time. And this would have been featured in the newspaper at some point. Wow. About how many of those negatives do we have in the collection? Uh, over a million. Wow. <laughs> I wish I knew the exact number, but uh, including the images that make it into the newspaper, there are many, many more that did not. This is Bubbish, Bubbish the Rabbit, an Angora. Uh, right. She belonged to Helen Jepson, who is pictured here lovingly tending to the fur of her. Mm -hmm. She was a soprano and uh, traveled around the United States performing. Here, uh, she is in town for a performance with the Minneapolis Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. Rabbit accompanied her all the time and traveling would make its fur get kind of matted. So uh, she groomed him quite a Okay. I am reminded, Lori, that yeah. we talked about hair wreaths and hair jewelry in a previous yeah. episode. Yeah. And this rabbit and angora fur being made into sweaters has me reminiscing about hair jewelry. Yeah. That would be really soft hair jewelry? Okay. Well, anyway, thank you for joining that connection to past episodes, Sandra. I appreciate it. So this um, is a very interesting and unusual photo, especially in, I'm wondering, is that her hair or a hat? It's definitely her hair. This is most likely Ada Zingara. It could be someone else, but Ada Zingara was a circus performer who worked primarily with snakes. Uh, the photographer who took this image had outposts in Preston and St. Paul, depending on the time period. So this could have been uh, a traveling circus that went to either of those locations. The hair is referred to as a Circassian style. It is mm. not. Mm. But during the 1860s, um, circus promoters glommed onto this idea of beautiful sort of Central Europeans with um, Africanized hair. Wow. And so their hair would kind of be teased and held with beer, apparently. And um, this was supposed to be kind of a sideshow. Eventually, that fell out of favor, but many of them still performed with reptiles in the circus. This image is about 1880, which fits with the time period when this hairstyle would have been used in a circus. Oh, and so we have some more reptiles here. Um, so what can you tell us about these uh, cold-blooded creatures? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fairly certain they're alligators. Um, on the left, we have Grace Wiley. She actually worked at the Minneapolis Public Library. At one time, they had a natural history museum under 
under the larger library umbrella. She was the curator of reptiles. Uh, she focused a lot with snakes. Most of the images and news articles I found about her feature snakes, but in this instance, she has an alligator. Apparently some of her coworkers were uncomfortable with um, her office mates. <laughs> <laughs> so Lori, I'm glad that as your office mate, you mm -hmm. don't have snakes in your office uh, yeah. or alligators. No, yeah. there's no room for them. <laughs> uh, she eventually moved to Chicago, uh, worked in a zoo there, and then out to Hollywood to consult on films that used reptiles. Um, and any guesses as to how she died? A venomous snake bite. Uh, it was um, kind of tragic. She didn't have her, the antidote that she typically had for the cobra bite that she received. The bottle was broken. And she was rushed to a California hospital, but they didn't have any uh, uh, antidotes available. Wow. Um, and so what time period are we talking here? Looks like the 20s from her hat. Uh, she was at the Minneapolis Public Library throughout the 20s and early 30s. Uh, so then, something I read said she had like 330 reptiles in her personal collection, and that's how she got the job in Chicago. She wrote to them and said, I want you to give me a job. I'll bring my own animals. <laughs> and so like, what's going on with the two um, kids and the baby alligators, maybe? They're actually not baby alligators. Uh, oh. They're the full size of this particular breed. I don't know which breed it is, but they belonged to uh, Miss Mary Carlton. And she was a teacher at Whittier School. Oh. And she kept these in the classroom. So each year, uh, a group of students got two extra classmates in their, in their classroom. What, what is going on here? Uh, what is going on here? It's actually kind of a sad story here. Oh, so, no. Well, it's, it's a story of farewells. So that's Jocko the monkey and mm -hmm. belongs to Glenn Smith, the truck driver. And Glenn Smith enlisted in the CBs, a, a division of the Navy, um, it was involved in construction during World War II. And his recruiting officer here is indicating that Jocko cannot come with. Oh. So Jocko needed to find a new home. But he uh, lived with Glenn and would ride around in his truck cab with him to keep him company. I don't know what happened to Jocko. I assume he found a new home. And lived happily ever after. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This reminds me of a local business owner. Uh, I haven't seen him in a few years, so I'm not sure of his current status, but I used to walk around Lake Como and see a fellow with his pet baboon, perhaps, on his shoulder. I'm, yeah. And he, he's been in the paper. I saw him in parades, local parades. So uh, I'm sure some folks watching will know exactly who I'm talking about. Who is this? Uh, this is a local artist. Uh, who had a pet pig named Susie. And she was covered by Virginia Stafford, who was a writer at the Minneapolis Star. She's a columnist, uh, really covered the society pages, traveled around the world writing about where she was. And she also uh, started Golfman and, or Golfer and Sportsman Magazine, which reported a lot on West Metro society folk. And that is a big pig, I just have to say. Yeah. Well, she is house trained, um, apparently. <laughs> the article indicated that, yes, uh, she was a, a very well-behaved pet pig. Oh, I added this just because I think it's adorable. So this is a, this is a painting from the 20s, and um, the dog is obviously not excited to go to the small animal hospital. By the guy. I have never seen this before uh, until until I was looking around for images. And um, I'm not sure, I think there's a police officer behind him, maybe, who doesn't look very happy. I don't know. I just, uh, I thought this was too adorable to leave. I hope so I put it in. Jen, do you know anything about either of these? Um, the sheep on the right was photographed by C.J. Hebbard, who was oh. one of the commercial photographers in Minneapolis around the turn of the um, century, uh, early 1900s. He then worked and sold his business to Norton and Peel, which as we know is uh, our very largest <laughs> commercial photography collection at the Historical Society. 
So we should see if we can get a Norton Peel photo in every single one of these that we do. Because <laughs> I bet we could. Well, you did that. pick one, Lori. There's one coming up. Yay. So, yay. <laughs> The, on the left there, there are, those are chicks in an incubator. I think it's 1950 and they're um, just cracking. I remember seeing the chicks um, get out of their eggs at the state fair and I just thought it was so adorable that I had to include them here. And so then on the right, we have a full grown chicken. This was a postcard, I think, is that right, Jen? It is, the format is a postcard and it came in with a collection of other postcards from the Kenyan area. Mm -hmm. I don't know that this postcard was one that was mass produced. A lot of people would just get their photographs developed as postcards and then they'd either keep them or they could mail them to friends. Um, just an alternative to the mass produced yeah. items. And then we have some cows because why not? Um, what I think is so interesting is that the one on the left is a postcard as well. And it's from 1915. And I was looking at that thinking, huh, I don't know, because the font at the top where it also says greetings from Minneapolis. When I think of Minneapolis, I do not think cows standing around in a field. <laughs> hey, I think it's someone's attempt at humor as oh. Minneapolis being sort of farm country. <laughs> Clearly it went right over our heads. <laughs> what can you tell us about this, Jen? So this was taken in Comfrey, Minnesota, which is just down the road from the Jeffers Petroglyphs historic mm -hmm. site. And in the early 70s, they were doing a photograph project. I'm assuming mostly of the petroglyphs and the area at the site, but the photographer was staying in the town. And I think this individual just happened to be going by and the photographer snapped the image because it's pretty fun. Okay, well, that's, that's what we have to share today. I learned a lot. I hope you have too. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you again next week. I wanted to remind you that if you wanna look up any of these images or others such as the goat, the outhouse, whatever, you can go to mnhs.org, under the research button, go to search online and take a look for yourself. Also, while you're there, look at history at home, please, and think about contributing to the History Is Now project. Uh, so I wanted to say thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Sandra and Jen, for being here. I really appreciate it, of course. Well, thanks for having me. Good to see you again, Lori. Thanks for the invite. I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much for um, joining me and teaching me, and we'll see you again. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.